When contemplating the possibilities of life in the universe at large, classically, Type M red dwarf stars seemed for many years to be ideal candidates for it. In their favor is the fact that they are by far the most numerous type of star in the universe. Indeed, over 70% of all stars are indeed red dwarfs. And they live the longest. Red dwarfs are estimated to live for trillions of years, and indeed, none of them have ever yet progressed to the theoretical next step in the life of a red dwarf, the blue dwarf. There simply hasn't been enough time since the Big Bang for that to happen. The main reason for this is that red dwarfs are fully convective. They move materials all through the star, which means that the full hydrogen fuel that the star formed with is available for fusion. And indeed, in recent years, we have found many exoplanets orbiting red dwarfs, and some of them seemingly ideal placed in the habitable zones of these stars. Examples here include the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri, which sports a planet, Proxima b, in its habitable zone. And another is the Trappist-1 system, where multiple planets exist in the same habitable zone. But in recent years, the landscape had changed against red dwarfs being very habitable. The reason for this is that when they are young, red dwarfs tend to be active flare stars. Indeed, gigantic flares can come off these things regularly that would seemingly blast the atmospheres off any planets in the habitable zone. The problem is made worse in that red dwarfs are tiny and dim, and as such, the habitable zone for one of these stars is very close in. Planets within these zones tend to orbit their star in a manner of days, and are so close that they are thought to be likely to be tidally locked, with one face always turned towards the red dwarf. But our understanding of science changes, sometimes dramatically so, with each new discovery, and that has recently happened with red dwarfs. I don't always get to deliver good astrobiology news on this channel, and with red dwarfs it's mostly been bad news for years as far as the possibility of life is concerned. Not so here. Red dwarfs have come screaming back to viability for life in a huge way. In a paper by Ekaterina Ilin and colleagues linked below, they detail that they were able to determine where the flares were originating on four red dwarfs based on predictions regarding their magnetic fields and watching the rapid rotation of these stars. They found that the flares originated from latitudes of 55 degrees to 81 degrees, placing them closer to the poles than is normal for a star like the Sun, having something to do with the magnetic fields of these stars. If more observations show this to be the case, then it would mean that the flares produced by red dwarfs would generally miss their habitable zone worlds. That would mean that red dwarfs are fully back on the table as far as the potential for life and even civilizations go. They would indeed be able to retain robust atmospheres that wouldn't be stripped off, and thusly maintain liquid water. But that doesn't remove all of the restrictions to life on worlds around red dwarfs. Still present is the problem of tidal locking. This situation would make tidally locked worlds into so-called eyeball worlds where one side is too hot to support life, and the other side is too cold. But with a thin band of habitability at the permanent twilight zone of these exoplanets. Recent work here, however, has shown that these kinds of worlds, providing the right conditions are present, can transfer heat to the cold side, allowing for an expanded area of habitability on some of these exoplanets. So what would life on a red dwarf exoplanet look like? these would be alien worlds indeed. While we can't say for certain what life on an alien world will look like, especially considering the enormous diversity of form life takes here on Earth, there are some clues. While certain things are going to be wildly different, evolution in terms of utility is always going to lead to favored paths by life anywhere in the universe. We see this on Earth. A dolphin and a shark are not closely related yet both share a similar form because that form is advantageous in their oceanic environment for what they do to survive. It can be envisioned that the forms of fish and aquatic mammals may have analogs living in exoplanet oceans. So while you can't predict exactly what they'd look like, you may well see some familiar shapes. Another area is that of plant analogs. Exoplanets around red dwarfs may have these, 
and they might take similar forms as trees and plants here on Earth. If Earth plants are any key, plants in general very much make use of red light frequencies from the sun. A red dwarf would seem ideal here, emitting plenty of red light for exoplants to use. But it's also been suggested that while plants in that environment might take recognizable forms, they would almost certainly not be green. In the light profile of a red dwarf, black plants seem a more likely path. This would lead to a very strange state of affairs if we were to ever visit a red dwarf inhabited exoplanet. It would be a redder environment, dimmer and more like twilight, with coal black plants. If on the dark side of a tightly locked world, in an ocean environment, it might become more like that of a cave here on Earth, with blind fish-like forms, using other senses to feed. Chemistry and a kind of sense of smell may replace vision and light. Indeed, a vision like this may be more common in the universe than our own brightly lit green landscape. But it could also be extraordinarily different in other ways. Our world has seen the dominance of amphibians, dinosaurs, and mammals at different times, but that's Earth, and there are certainly other paths, and an exoplanet may have seen a dominance of a life form that we have no analog of at all governed by a radically different planetary history than our own. Earth's history, to a large degree, has shaped its flora and fauna, and no doubt a planet with a very different history would be very different indeed, and would have different atmospheres. But then comes the greatest question of all, civilizations. Our sun is known to not really be ideal for civilizations to arise. It happened, but only recently in the history of Earth. And then it happened towards the end of the period of habitability for this world. One can envision a red dwarf exoplanet that has seen a far longer period of stability, and will continue to see that stability for trillions of years. This allows for two possibilities regarding civilizations. The first is that red dwarfs may have had significantly more time than the sun to have developed past or current civilizations. But the second is that they're all young, and will have vast amounts of time to develop future civilizations. This allows for some interesting ideas. If a planet can have such a long period of habitability around a red dwarf, and life evolves in the right direction for intelligence, then why not a planet that develops multiple intelligent species all with civilizations? One example of this in sci-fi are the Zindi of Star Trek Enterprise, where there were multiple instances on a single world of intelligent life, one extinct. There could be planets where alien archaeologists study not the fossils of dinosaurs, but the fossils of technosignatures of civilized species that came before them that were wiped out, perhaps by an asteroid, millions of years previous. Or perhaps the rule is that once multiple intelligent species arise on a planet, a war develops, or the pre-existing intelligent species actively works to downshift the up-and-coming one. If we manage to survive for a few million years more, this could be a problem for us. If, for example, the dolphins become increasingly intelligent to the point that they ask us to figure out a way to liberate them from their oceanic prison and give them a better engineered physiology, do we do that? Or do we simply let nature take its course? making for vengeful, angry, intelligent dolphins that eventually develop better physiology. Then they uplift everything in the ocean to be intelligent, and it becomes a season of revenge on the humans that ends in our extinction. Or is it simply better to prevent evolution from going into such untidy territory? Humans will rue the day when the clams become intelligent. This also opens the way for a future for the universe where an explosion of intelligence occurs as the Red Dwarfs age. Perhaps we may be early examples of it. There may be a time where intelligent civilizations blossom in the Milky Way and become ubiquitous among the Red Dwarfs. But there's also the possibility of mass migrations to Red Dwarfs for civilizations like us that arose around ancient, changing stars like the Sun. The Red Dwarfs may not simply be places where life can arise, but also make for perfect retirement homes for civilizations that arose around G-type stars. And eventually, in the very distant future, the Red Dwarfs may be the only game in town as far as stars go, 
and all civilizations come to settle around them. Or even construct red dwarfs from other stars or gas clouds. Perhaps technosignatures in this regard might include artificial red dwarfs tailored to be perfect to settle around. Or what would happen if we saw a star, say a blue dwarf, that should not exist in nature yet? The return of the red dwarf stars to the potential realms of habitability is an interesting and welcome development. But there is one last question here. If red dwarfs have truly habitable zones, and they are so ridiculously common, then what are the odds of us not having evolved around one? That question was recently asked by David Kipping in a paper and tackled on his Cool Worlds YouTube channel, link in the description below. Well worth a watch. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently ruining the day I was sitting on my porch thinking about sapient clams and the revenge. This works for most living things on Earth that might eventually have a bone to pick with us. Imagine it, the day the corn got angry, or Terminator-like cyborg chickens with the Super Peck beak adaptation, and an egg cannon. Some say I worry about the activities of the future of my food too much. I think not, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.